Hello, Las Vegas. Welcome back. We're live from the Engadget stage at CES 2016. My name is Michael Gorman. I'm the editor-in-chief of Engadget, and we're here today to talk about car stuff. Uh, CES has become kind of a big thing for the car companies in recent years, so we're going to hit the good, bad, and the ugly of the show this year. And joining me on stage to have that conversation, we have some experts. Senior editor, Roberto Baldwin. Robbie, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Yes. Um, I wish there was a car that I could drive through the show floor. That would be nice. Just have like, people. It could be like a nice seas. thin car and have like a you know like the little gates you have on the front of oh, yeah. uh, like trains, like a cow catcher, like yeah, for, yeah. for a people catcher. BMW is doing test drives. You could just go rogue. Oh, just go. Rogue. <laughs> That's a big thing. You're driving on the pedestrian area is the thing in Vegas. Oh, okay. Well, there. I'll, I'm going to head to BMW next. Okay. Maybe CS 2017. We'll get that. Uh, of course, next to Robbie, we have Mike Austin, this, the uh, editor-in-chief of Autoblog. Mike, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Doing well. Yeah. Trippin' to the finish. We're almost done with CES. <laughs> it is. We're on. We've got one day left. And then on the end, we have the editor-in-chief of Autoblog Green, Sebastian Blanco. Hello. And as you say, this is a much more of a car show in the past, and it's my first CES. Yeah, so that's, that's right. So that's a sign that something's happening here that wasn't happening here before. That's right. And Mike, it's your first CES too, right? It, it's my first time with Autoblog and my first time in three years. Okay. And it's, it's changed a lot in that time. Yeah, yeah. And Robbie, this is your... 43rd year. Yeah, I feel like you're, you're a staple here. I, yeah. I have a room right, right he behind He just lives the, here. Uh, right. He has a shack where he would My make life is just moments dark. between CES. <laughs> yeah. All right, isn't it for all of us, really? It's like, yes. it's just counting down the days. As soon as we it. leave, we just start scheduling yeah. and, and yeah. getting prepared. All right, so uh, for, well, I'll start with you, Sebastian, since this is your very first CES. What has it been like for you? Well, I actually came in on Monday, so it's been a very long week. Yep. Um, had to do the Faraday Future thing Monday night. And it's, I mean, it feels in some ways very much like a car show. Yeah. You know, you have unveilings, you have the CEO of GM here. I mean, if you, if you were in that room over there and you just look at the automotive booths, you might as well be in, like, it's going to look like Detroit next week, Yeah. basically. Um, so that part hasn't been overwhelming to me. I'm used to that. Yeah. I go into these rooms over here and see the endless array of <laughs> iPhone chargers, and I don't know what to do. That's just <laughs> not my scene, so. <laughs> so many phone cases and chargers. So many. Yeah. So I just walk past those. Okay, right Where's on. the cars? Where's the wheels? Yeah. Mike, what about you? So it has a, it's a three-year gap for you. What is what has this year's show been like? What's changed? The big thing is, like Sebastian was saying, it's kind of like a car show, but it's actually different because it's not here's the car and it's this you know thing, look at the car, it's pretty, maybe look at the interior. There's all these interactive displays. And that's, that's the big change for me is the way people are interacting with cars and the stuff cars can do. And the displays reflect that. It's like, you know, this is what you're going to interact with. This is what people are into and what's exciting about cars. Yeah. And you get to play with it instead of just looking at wheels and doors. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into what we thought was exciting about cars this week. Sebastian, you mentioned Faraday Future. What, you, what do we need to know about Faraday Future? Um, just the, the basics as far as what you need to know about the car. It is the first physical manifestation we've seen of this fairly secretive company called Faraday Future. They came on the radar. They've been kind of around a year and a half, but they kind of came on the radar earlier this year. And this was their first concept car. They call it a car of concepts. They're trying to be different. Like, we're not a car company. We're a tech company, which is why they debuted it here okay. instead of the LA Auto Show a couple months ago or, again, Detroit next week. They want to be seen as a very techie company. Um, the, one of the better analyses that I heard about this car is that this is kind of absurd when you look at it. This is not yeah. the car that you want to show to the world to say, we are going to change transportation. Yeah. But the things they're saying are, we want to change transportation. So they're talking about electromobility, they're talking about connected cars, car sharing, all the stuff that a lot of automakers are indeed talking about. Right. But they have a lot of um, uh, engineering like capabilities from the connections with LETV, the Chinese group that's behind the money that's behind this the Faraday future as well. Okay. So there could be something there that is kind of hidden by this concept car. If you just focus on the car, you're like, that's kind of crazy. But if you look behind it and think of what they've got potentially going on, it could be something. They, they've been hiring a lot of Tesla and automotive experts and engineers, too. So sure. they're, they're buying up the knowledge very quickly. And they have truckloads of cash, most importantly. The, the guy behind LETV, which is supporting Faraday Future, is the 17th or 14th, I think 17th richest man in China, and is worth almost $8 billion. So yeah, they got money. 
Yeah. So one person will own that car. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's yeah, his car. He built it's, it for himself. Yeah. And, and what's funny is that the company has this very, like, love child, like, we're going to change the future, and it's very lovey-dovey, and then they come out with this car. It's like your hippie uncle showing up in an Armani suit. Yeah. And uh, to be honest with y'all, I think it's kind of ugly. It, I was going to say, it is one of the other that's my That's my ugly portion of the car portion. It's the, the car you drew when you were 13 years old right? on your, peach, on your, if like, you, your notebook. If, if you go back and look at the, the classic Homer from The Simpsons, yeah. there's a that's lot right. of that. There. That bubble window, <laughs> That's right. there's a lot going on there. So I, I, I do want to talk about this now. Sebastian, you wrote something earlier this week with the Tesla connection, right? That Tesla has had a greater effect on CS, and they're not even here, right? And Faraday is kind of the epitome of that. If yeah. you look at any article, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody, about Faraday Future that was written this week, yeah. I will bet big dollars that each article says Tesla somewhere in there. And that's kind of the way that Tesla dominates the, the electric auto industry right now. They're just yeah. such a popular brand, and people want to talk about them. But every time somebody wrote Faraday, they also wrote Tesla. Yeah. And looking around the show, there were a lot of ways that I saw Tesla's influence here, even though Tesla does not have a booth here. Right. They didn't spend any money to come advertise here. They may have had a representative in the Panasonic booth because Panasonic supplies the cells the that are in the right. Tesla battery. Yeah. So there's a Model S over there, and there's a guy in a Tesla jacket. I don't know who he's working for. But, so there may be some somewhat official connection. Yeah. Or that guy could just be a Tesla fan. I don't know. Like, I didn't talk to him. You know, he could just be a Super dude. Super fan. Yeah. He just bought the shirt and showed up. Well, they make a lot of money himself. off of their, their jackets and right. hats. So, you know, their fans are out there. <laughs> They're like the Harley Davidson of cars. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you see that. And then in that same booth, Panasonic also has the electric scooters from Gogoro. Yep. However you pronounce that. Robbie knows all about that. If you, but did you see the display where they have the batteries next to those little electric scooters? They're like, these are 18650 cells. It's the exact same setup as they have next to the Tesla car. They just don't say Tesla by the scooter. Right. Probably they can't. Yeah. But like, they, people who know, and I think people who are here at CES know these sort of things, know why those 18650 cells are there. It's because they're in the Tesla in the other corner, and they want to draw that connection. So right. I just see, as someone who covers them a lot as well, maybe I'm looking for it, yeah. but I see Tesla in a lot of things here, even though Tesla's not here. Well, and they have also, I mean, you know, they've, they've uh, Faraday, to bring it back to that, like they brought in talent from Tesla, like they hired some of their engineering teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were talking about this backstage, how a lot of the EV, like particularly with, with Faraday, they're saying we want to build kind of a platform and it's not about the car itself, it's about the other stuff we can bring inside the car using the screen that we've got in the dashboard. Right, there's, the LETV is a content company, it's called the Netflix of China. Yeah. Netflix is never gonna build and sell you a car. But if somebody like Netflix or Apple, we're gonna get or Google, we're gonna get into the car business. They're much more interested in the way that that screen connects to your life, connects to the microtransactions, yeah. connects to your phone. And so, one of the more interesting things I heard on Monday night at the Faraday Future thing was people saying this might be the first car company that's not really driven by making the car, but driven by that content. Now, all the automakers want to figure out how to get your phone to talk to your car better, yep. but this one might be coming at the entire production of the car, the design of the car from a different angle, and that's another one of those examples, those things I saying. If you look at the car itself, kind of looks silly, but if you look a little deeper, there could be something there that we shouldn't instantly discount yeah. just because they have the Homer up on stage. So, I mean, what do you think, Mike? As someone who follows the industry, are you buying that? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of carry this grudge from CES where people look at Tesla, look at these tech companies, and they go, Oh, these guys are so far ahead. All the automotive companies, they all have offices in Silicon Valley. They're all working on all this stuff. Uh, you know, like Ford announced a partnership with, uh, with Toyota that they're using the same app platform. Like, yeah. Toyota didn't go to Google. They didn't go to another supplier. They went to Ford. So all the automakers are working on this. But to Sebastian's point, taking it from that different angle is, is really the change point. And I think that's also the huge development here at CES is this convergence of all of the other connected stuff we have. The platform is there now. The conduit is there, and we're figuring out ways to integrate it into the car and into the rest of our lives. And it's really going to change the way people think about cars. It's, yeah. it's less about how the car drives and more about how it makes every part of your life easier or better. Yeah. There was another thing that we didn't talk about before, but that fits in with this really well. I was able to go to a, a group dinner with Mark Fields, the CEO of Ford, sure. uh, on Tuesday night. 
And one of the more surprising things that he said during the Q&A afterward was this idea that Ford, when you think of Ford, you think of cars. I mean, they're, like, they're one of the oldest names in the business, but yep. he's like, the definition of what is going to, what Ford is going to strive for in the near future is to become a data company, collecting information when they opt in, collecting information from the drivers, using that, figuring out about you know, how they drive in an electric car, how they charge and traffic and all this stuff. But that's going to become more important than you know, the, the idea of Ford as a transportation or a car yeah. company. Um, and are we, th I mean, that's basically, he's not talking about it just in the context of like autonomous vehicles, right? Because obviously that, that captures a lot of d data or is that really basically what he's saying? It's also their connected car platform. Yeah. You know, they're they're looking at like car to go. They're like, how are we? You know, they have multiple pilots doing all this research into how are people moving about cities. Oh, okay, yeah, and yeah. And yeah. so they want to collect that data, and they want people to, uh, uh, you know, either you buy a Ford and you allow other people to drive it, or you subscribe to their sort of like car to go system. A few years ago, the big sort of buzzword in the automakers was we're not we're not car companies, we're mobility companies, and that's right. more of a a little bit of a shift. Going from a car or a mobility company to an information or data company, that's a whole paradigm shift. Yeah. But when, and when you think about the connected cars and what they can do now in terms of, you know, your phone tracks you and there's all this data on your phone habits and where you are. Cars generate way more information than that. You've got all of the information about the road, how yeah. people are driving, where they're going. So that's a ton of data they're going to be able to use to research and better. And when you put it in light of autonomous cars, the cars will be sending information about the maps or about road conditions, and it's going to turn into a thing where every mile you drive the car, it's going to make the car better. Yeah. Almost like in a, in a self-evolving way. Yeah. Cool. All right, this is the last thing I want to hit on from Faraday. This is something else that we briefly touched on. It's time to get deep into the conspiracy theories here. So you were mentioning that there are people rumbling that Faraday might actually be a front for an Apple car. There's, you hear all sorts of things. I mean, you guys spend time right. on the internet, don't you? I mean, this is like, it's fun to speculate, <laughs> like a, right? Couple, That's, just couple just hours a y'all, this is total and complete speculation. <laughs> we have no information indicating that yeah, this is Yeah, and my, my, my guess is it's not in any yeah. way connected. But the, the theory good. goes is that there's lots of rumors of an Apple car. Apple wants to build a car. Today yeah. that we just found out that they registered, what, Apple.car? Like, new URL to really, that's a pretty strong hint that they're doing something. Yeah. So... If you're Apple and you like to bring things out in secret, you're going to need somebody else to build your phone or your car for you because you can't go building a car plant. People will see that. Yeah. So if you start this other company and have them build a plant, it's actually going to be not too far from you. It's north of Las Vegas yep. a little ways. And, you know, that Faraday in, this, in the rumor could be the front for then all of a sudden it's revealed, oh, actually, this is an Apple project. Yeah. You buying that, there Robin? You go. No. <laughs> Not even a little bit. Because you look at that car, and now you think about Johnny Ive looking at that car. Yeah, but wouldn't that and throw having you like off a brain totally? aneurysm? And then partnering <laughs> with people who are just coming out and saying, hey, we made this thing. No. They were, they, they were kind of secretive, but they let things leak, and yeah. uh, they, that's not. Apple would have had, they would, they would have clamped that down. And we wouldn't, hear, we wouldn't hear anything until Apple had a car. I'm just Like, they'll be making a car, like, in the Arctic. Yeah. Or in Antarctica, in yeah. a secret underground Under base. Lair. It'll be like a, yeah. like a lair. That's okay. where, and then it'll just appear one day. <laughs> See, I was hoping it was going to be more of the like uh, WWE wrestling style. They come out and, and Tim Cook rips his shirt off and it says Faraday Future. And then he rips that patch off and it says the Apple car or something. And then he hits someone over the head with a chair. That's that would be fun. They're, they're gonna yeah. They'll interrupt someone else's press conference <laughs> yeah. and call them out. Exactly. <laughs> Bring the car. I'm sorry, Elon. I got something for the you, brother. nice, but. <laughs> okay. Well, enough of the the kind of make believe car stuff that we're talking about here. Um, the other another very big thing, and Robbie, I know you got to test drive it as did Sebastian, but I'll start with you, Robbie. Um, the Chevy Bolt. Why should we care? Why is this a big deal? It's a big deal because. Right now, when you look at a, long, a longer range electric vehicle, it's Tesla. And I can't afford a Tesla. No. I, I would expect that most people cannot afford a Tesla. You, well, unless you're a founder or a you're the 17th richest man in China, you can't afford a Tesla. Of the, the Chevy Bolt is like, oh, you know what? Here's a car for everyone else who wants to jump into the electric car world without yep. worrying about, oh, I can only go 50 miles. You like can, a leaf. Yeah. I, yeah, I looked at a leaf for my wife, and I was like, nope, this isn't going to work, because it was around. But 200 miles, 
for thirty-ish thousand dollars, that's that's a huge deal. Yeah, yeah, it is. and it's actually a, a, a pretty good like it's a, it's a nice compact car. You drive it, you're like, oh, this is a, it's solid. It doesn't feel janky. It doesn't feel like let's make electric car and then think about the car part later. It's yeah. like let's make a car and then add all this important stuff that people want to. Yeah. It. What about you, Sebastian? What were your I thoughts? agree that it's a uh, it's very it's very roomy inside. As you can see in the video behind us, there, we only got to drive it through the parking lot, going through those cones. It wasn't a whole lot of test driving we got to do. This these are prototype versions. We'll be getting towards the actual test drive soon because it's going into production late this year. So this is a very fast moving project for GM. Um, but the little thing that you did get to experience, it does have nice acceleration because an electric car, that's just the nature yeah. of what an electric motor gets lots you. Lots of torque. Lots of torque, all of it from zero RPM. And the, the interface, um, the way that the, uh, the screen is set up, it, it shows, like you said, that they put a lot of thought into this design. Um, there's little uh, like help buttons and question marks on the screen. And when you've, been, when you've been in a lot of electric cars like I have, I don't need to be told, okay, this car connects to your phone and you can remote charge. I don't need to understand what kilowatt you know, hour per mile is because yeah. we just have seen this over and over. But if you're GM and you want to expand the reach of an EV to way beyond the Volt and way beyond the Spark EV and then taking over Leaf customers or potential Leaf customers, and it's really getting to like, you know, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000 cars a year, which they do with other models, but... They, no, no electric car does that. You need simple things like a little help button on your screen to help the new EV owner figure out what's happening because yeah. there's no gas can. Just, the things that you're used to don't exist here. So, oh, now there's just an instant help button right there. I don't have to go to the instruction or the, the owner's manual. I can just figure out right away, here's how my car, my new car is working. Yeah. And so the Bolt has things like that built in, which is to me is a good sign of a company that is thinking through how to expand the marketplace. Yeah. What about, I mean, Mike, how do you feel about this? Like $30,000, A, to me, that's a big question. That's still not a cheap vehicle, but that certainly does approach affordability. Right, and so it's thirty-seven five, and then yep. if you take the federal tax rebate off, it's 30. You know, a lot of it's lease deals. That's a pretty good segment, and it's in the range where people are going to spend a little extra money to have the EV. They're willing to do it for, for green or for the novelty or for yep. uh, even, even the convenience. You know, they don't, like Sebastian was saying, it's got great torque. They don't shift. They're super quiet. You never go to the gas station. Yeah. That's worth a lot to some people. But I think the big thing is Chevy's coming out with this car, and they're going to beat the Tesla Model 3 to market by a few years. And yeah. Nissan has a Leaf that's coming out. It's right on the horizon. That's going to be a 200-mile car also, Yeah. Um, which is, I think that's the big development is we have, like you said, $30,000 and a, a, enough range that it could be your only car. So, I mean, is this the year, is 2016 the year when we have EVs actually reach significant numbers of people, or is that unrealistic in the first year? Not, not to, well, it's coming, it's going into production at the end of 2016, oh, okay. so it'll so be out maybe December, but early 2017 okay. probably, so not, not this year, no. Yeah. But every, well, this year actually sales did go down compared to last year, plug-in cars in general. Yeah. You know, no new models. The, the Volt came out at the end of 2015. Gas prices were low. People are waiting for the new models. So, like, there are reasons for that. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure we'll be seeing upswing, if not 2016, definitely 2017, when this and other options come to market. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, and we've got really cheap gas right now. And yep. yet, you look at the automakers, they're all moving to electrification. So, they're, you know, they're, it's not even a hedging a bet. They're saying this is the future. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're doing that without $4 gas. Right on. And as more people buy these electric cars, the cost of, you know, because we're making more batteries, the production cost goes down, as, and as prices go down, and more people buy electric cars, but yeah. It's the virtuous cycle. Yeah. All right, y'all, well, that's all the time that we have. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me on stage. We've got more coming, so stay tuned. And of course, we've got the Best of CS Awards tonight at 5 o'clock, so we will talk to y'all later. Bye. Thank you.